Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, Chapter 10. A charming introduction to a hermit's life. Four weeks torture, tossing and sickness. All oh, these bleak winds and bitter northern skies and impassable roads and dilatory country surgeons. And all oh, this dearth of the human physiognomy. And worse than all, the terrible intimation of Kenneth that I need not expect to be outdoors till spring. Mr Heathcliff has just honoured me with a call. About seven days ago he sent me a brace of grouse, the last of the season. Scoundrel! He's not altogether guiltless in this illness of mine, and that I had a great mind to tell him. But alas, how could I offend a man who was charitable enough to sit at my bedside a good hour and talk on some other subject than pills and draughts, blisters and leeches? This is quite an easy interval. I'm too weak to read, yet I feel as if I could enjoy something interesting. Why not have up Mrs Dean to finish her tale? I can recollect its chief incidents as far as she had gone. Yes, I remember her hero had run off and never been heard of for three years, and the heroine was married. I'll ring. She'll be delighted to find me capable of talking cheerfully. Mrs Dean came. <clears throat> it wants twenty minutes, sir, to take in the medicine, she commenced. Away, away with it, I replied. I desire to have... The doctor says you must drop the powders. With all my heart, don't interrupt me. Come and take your seat here. Keep your fingers from that bitter phalanx of vials. Draw your knitting out of your pocket. That will do. Now, continue the his history of Mr Heathcliff from where you left off to the present day. Did he finish his education on the continent? Come back a gentleman? Or did he get a Sizar's place at college? Or escape to America? and earn honours by drawing blood for his foster country, or make, make a fortune more promptly on the English highways. He may have done a little in all those vacations, Mr Lockwood, but I couldn't give my word for any. I stated before that I did not know how he gained his money. Neither am I aware of the means he took to raise his mind from the savage ignorance into which it was sunk. But with your leave I'll proceed in my own fashion, if you think it will amuse and not weary you. Are you feeling better this morning? Much. That's good news. I got Miss Catherine and myself to Thrushcross Grange, and to my agreeable disappointment she behaved infinitely better than I dared to expect. She seemed almost over-fond of Mr Linton, and even to his sister she showed plenty of affection. They were both very attentive to her comfort, certainly. It was not the thorn bending to the honeysuckles, but the honeysuckles embracing the thorn. There were no mutual concessions. One stood erect and the others yielded. And who can be ill-natured and bad-tempered when they encounter neither opposition nor indifference? I observed that Mr Edgar had a deep-rooted fear of her ruffling, of ruffling her humour. He concealed it from her, but if ever he heard me answer sharply or saw any other servant grow cloudy at some imperious order of hers, he would show his trouble by a frown of displeasure that never darkened on his own account. He many a time spoke sternly to me about my pertness, and averred that the stab of a knife could not inflict a worse pang than he suffered at seeing his lady vexed. Not to grieve a kind master, I learned to be less touchy, and for the space of half a year the gunpowder lay as harmless as sand, because no fire came near to explode it. Catherine had seasons of gloom and silence now and then, they were respected with sympathising silence by her husband, who ascribed them to an alteration in her constitution, produced by her perilous illness, as she was never subject to depression of spirits before. The return of sunshine was welcomed by answering sunshine from him. I believe I may assert that they really were in possession of deep and growing happiness. It ended. Well, we must be for ourselves in the long run. The mild and generous are only more justly selfish when the, when the domineering. And it ended when circumstances caused each to feel that the one's interest was not the chief consideration in the other's thoughts. On a mellow evening in September, I was coming from the garden with a heavy basket of apples, which I'd been gathering. It had got dusk, and the moon looked over the high wall of the court, causing undefined shadows to lurk in the corners of the numerous projecting portions of the building. I set my burden on the house steps by the kitchen door and lingered to rest, and drew in a few breaths 
of the soft, sweet air. My eyes were on the moon and my back to the entrance when I heard a voice behind me say, Nelly, is that you? It was a deep voice and foreign in tone, yet there was something in the manner of pronouncing my name which made it sound familiar. I turned about to discover who spoke fearfully, for the doors were shut and I'd seen nobody on approaching the steps. Something stirred in the porch and moving nearer I distinguished a tall man dressed in dark clothes with a dark face and hair. He leant against the side and held his fingers on the latch as if intending to open it for himself. Who can it be, I thought? Mr Earnshaw? Oh no, the voice has no resemblance to his. I've waited here an hour, he resumed, while I continued staring, and the whole of that time all round has been as still as death. I dared not enter. You do not know me. Look, I'm not a stranger. A ray fell on his features. His cheeks were sallow and half covered with black whiskers, the brows lowering. The eyes deep set and singular. I remembered the eyes. What? I cried, uncertain whether to regard him as a worldly visitor, and I raised my hands in amazement. What? You come back? Is it really you? Is it? Yes. Heathcliff, he replied, glancing from me up to the windows, which reflected a score of glittering moons, but showed no lights from within. Are they at home? Where is she, Nelly? You're not glad. You needn't be so disturbed. Is she here? Speak. I want to have one word with her, your mistress. Go and say some person from Gimmerton desires to see her. How will she take it? I exclaimed. What will she do? The surprise bewilders me. It will put her out of her head. And you are, Heathcliff, but altered, nay. There's no comprehending. Have you been for a soldier? Go and carry my message, he interrupted impatiently. I'm in hell till you do. He lifted the latch and I entered. But when I got to the parlour where Mr and Mrs Linton were, I could not persuade myself to proceed. At length I resolved on making an excuse to ask if they would have the candles lighted, and I opened the door. They sat together in a window whose lattice lay back against the wall, and displayed, beyond the garden trees and the wild green park, the valley of Gimmerton with a long line of mist winding nearly to its top. For very soon after you pass the chapel, as you may have noticed, the soft that runs from the marshes joins a beck which follows the bend of the glen. Wuthering Heights rose above this silvery vapour, but our old house was invisible. It rather dips down on the other side. Both the room and its occupants, and the scene they gazed on, looked wondrously peaceful. I shrank reluctantly from performing my errand, and was actually going away, leaving it unsaid, after having put my question about the candles, when a sense of my folly compelled me to return and mutter, A person from Gimmerton wishes to see you, ma'am. What does he want? Answered, asked Mrs Linton. I did not question him, I answered. Well, close the curtains, Nelly, she said, and bring up tea. I'll be back again directly. She quitted the apartment. Mr Edgar inquired carelessly who it was. Someone mistress does not expect, I replied. That Heathcliff, you recollect him, sir, who used to live at Mr Earnshaw's. What? The gypsy? The ploughboy? Why did you not say so to Catherine? Hush, you must not call him by those names, master. She'll be sadly grieved to hear you. She was nearly heartbroken when he ran off. I guess this return will make a jubilee to her. Mr Linton walked to a window on the other side of the room that overlooked the court. He unfastened it and leant out. I suppose they were below, for he exclaimed quickly, Don't stand there, love. Bring the person in, if it be any one particular. Ere long I heard the click of the latch, and Catherine flew upstairs, breathless and wild, too excited to show gladness. Indeed, by her face, you would rather have surmised an awful calamity. Oh, Edgar, Edgar, she panted, flinging her arms around his neck. Oh, Edgar, darling, Heathcliff's come back. He is... And she tightened her embrace to a squeeze. Well, well, cried her husband crossly. Don't strangle me for that. He never struck me as a marvellous treasure. There's no need to be frantic. I know you didn't like him, she answered, repressing a little the intensity of her delight. 
Yet for my sake you must be friends now. Shall I tell him to come up? Here, he said, into the parlour. Where else? she asked. He looked vexed and suggested the kitchen as a more suitable place for him. Mrs Linton eyed him with a droll expression, half angry, half laughing at his fastidiousness. No, she added after a while, I cannot sit in the kitchen. Set two tables here, Ellen, one for your master and Miss Isabella, being gentry, the other for Heathcliff and myself, being of the lower orders. Will that please you, dear? Of course, I must have a fire lighted elsewhere. If so, give directions. I'll run down and secure my guest. I'm afraid the joy is too great to be real. She was about to dart off again, but Edgar arrested her. You bid him step up, he said, addressing me. And Catherine, try to be glad without being absurd. The whole household need not witness the sight of your welcoming a runaway servant as a brother. I descended and found Heathcliff waiting under the porch, evidently anticipating an invitation to enter. He followed my guidance without waste of words, and I ushered him into the presence of the master and the mistress, whose flushed cheeks betrayed signs of warm talking. But the ladies glowed with another feeling when her friend appeared at the door. She sprang forward, took both his hands and led him to Linton, and then she seized Linton's reluctant fingers and crushed them into his. Now fully revealed by the fire and the candlelight, I was amazed more than ever to behold the transformation of Heathcliff. He had grown a tall, athletic, well-formed man, beside whom my master seemed quite slender and youth-like. His upright carriage suggested the idea of his having been in the army. His countenance was much older in expression and decision of feature than Mr Linton's. It looked intelligent and retained no marks of former de degradation. A half-civilised ferocity lurked yet in the depressed brows and eyes full of black fire, but it was subdued and his manner was even dignified. Quite divested of rough roughness, though too stern for grace. My master's surprise equalled or exceeded mine. He remained for a minute at a loss how to address the ploughboy, as he called him. Heathcliff dropped his slight hand and stood looking at him coldly, till he chose to speak. Sit down, sir, he said at length. Mrs Linton, recalling old times, would have, given you, would have me give you a cordial reception, and of course I'm gratified when anything occurs to please her. And I also, answered Heathcliff, especially if it be anything in which I have a part. I shall stay an hour or two willingly. He took a seat opposite Catherine, who kept her gaze fixed on him, as if she feared he would vanish were she to remove it. He did not raise his to her often. A quick glance now and then sufficed but it flashed back each time more confidently the undisguised delight he drank from hers. They were too much absorbed in their mutual joy to suffer embarrassment. Not so Mr Edgar. He grew pale with pure annoyance, a feeling that reached its climax when his lady rose and stepping across the rug seized Heathcliff's hands again and laughed like one beside herself. I shall think it a dream tomorrow, she cried. I shall not be able to believe that I've seen and touched and spoken to you once more. And yet, cruel Heathcliff, you don't deserve this welcome, to be absent and silent for three years and never to think of me. A little more than you thought of me, he murmured. I heard of your marriage, Cathy, not long since. And while waiting in the yard below, I meditated this plan, just to have one glimpse of your face, a stare of surprise, perhaps, and pretended pleasure. Afterwards, settle my score with Hindley, and then prevent the law by doing execution on myself. Your welcome has put these ideas out of my mind, but beware of meeting me with another aspect next time. Nay, you'll not drive me off again. You were really sorry for me, were you? Well, there was cause. I've fought through a bitter life since I last heard your voice, and you must forgive me, for I struggled only for you. Catherine, unless we are to have cold tea, please come to the table, interrupted Linton, striving to preserve his ordinary tone and a due measure of politeness. Mr Heathcliff will have a long walk, wherever he may lodge tonight, and I'm thirsty. She took her post before the urn, and Mrs Isabella came, summoned by the bell. Then, having handed their chairs forward, I left the room. The meal hardly endured ten minutes. Catherine's cup was never filled. She could neither eat nor drink. Edgar had made a slop in his saucer and scarcely swallowed a mouthful. 
their guest did not protract his stay that evening above an hour longer. I asked as he departed if he went to Gimmerton. No, to Wuthering Heights, he answered. Mr Earnshaw invited me when I called this morning. Mr Earnshaw invited him? And he called on Mr Earnshaw? I pondered this sentence painfully after he was gone. Is he turning out a bit of a hypocrite and coming into the country to work mischief under a cloak? I mused. I had a presentiment in the bottom of my heart that he'd better have remained away. About the middle of the night, I wakened from my first nap by Mrs Linton, gliding into my chamber, taking a seat on my bedside and pulling me by the hair to rouse me. I cannot rest, Ellen, she said by way of apology, and I want some living creature to keep me company in my happiness. Edgar is sulky because I'm glad of a thing that does not interest him. He refuses to open his mouth except to utter pettish, silly speeches, and he affirmed I was cruel and selfish for wishing to talk when he was so sick and sleepy. He always contrives to be sick at the least cross. I gave a few sentences of commendation to Heathcliff, and he, either for a headache or a pang of envy, began to cry, so I got up and left him. What use is it praising Heathcliff to him? I answered. As lads, they have an aversion to each other, and Heathcliff would hate just as much to hear him praised. It's human nature. Let Mr Linton alone about him, unless you would like an open quarrel between them. But does he not show great weakness? pursued she. I'm not envious. I never feel hurt at the brightness of Isabella's yellow hair, and the whiteness of her skin, at her dainty elegance, and the fondness all the family exhibit for her. Even you, Nelly, if we have a dispute sometimes, you back Isabella at once and I yield like a foolish mother. I call her a darling and flatter her into good temper. It pleases her brother to see us cordial, and that pleases me. But they're very much alike. They're spoiled children and fancy the world is made for their accommodation. And though I humour both, I think a smart chastisement might improve them all the same. You're mistaken, Mrs Linton, said I. They humour you. I know what there would be to do if they did not. I can well afford to indulge at their passing whims as long as their business is to anticipate all of your desires. You may, however, fall out at last over something of equal consequence to both sides, and then those you term weak are very capable of being as obstinate as you. And then we shall fight to the death, shan't we, Nelly? she returned, laughing. No, I tell you, I have such faith in Linton's love that I believe I might kill him and he wouldn't wish to retaliate. I advised her to value him the more for his affection. I do, she answered, but he needn't resort to whining for trifles. It's childish, and instead of melting into tears because I said that Heathcliff was now worthy of anyone's regard, and it would honour the first gentleman in the country to be his friend, he ought to have said it for me and have been delighted from sympathy. He must get accustomed to him, and he may as well like him. Considering how Heathcliff has reason to object to him, I'm sure he behaved excellently. What do you think of his going to Wuthering Heights? I inquired. He's reformed in every respect, apparently. Quite a Christian, offering the right hand of fellowship to his enemies all round. He explained it, she replied. I wonder as much as you. He said he called to gather information concerning me from you, supposing you resided there still. And Joseph told Hindley, who came out and fell to questioning him of what he'd been doing and how he'd been living, and finally desired him to walk in. There were some persons sitting at cards. Heathcliff joined them. My brother lost some money to him, and finding him plentifully supplied, he requested that he'd come again in the evening, to which he consented. Hindley is too reckless to select his acquaintance prudently. He doesn't trouble himself to reflect on the causes he might have for mistrusting one whom he has basely injured. But Heathcliff affirms his principal reason for resuming a connection with his ancient persecutor is a wish to install himself in quarters at walking distance from the Grange, and an attachment to the house where we live together, and likewise I hope that I shall have more opportunities of seeing him there than I could have if he settled in Gimmerton. He means to offer liberal payment for permission to lodge at the Heights, and doubtless my brother's covetousness will prompt him to accept the terms. He was always greedy, though what he grasps with one hand he flings away with the other. It's a nice place for a young man to fix his dwelling in, said I. Have you no fear of the consequences, Mrs Linton? None for my friend, she replied. His strong head will keep him from danger. A little from Hindley, but he can't be made morally worse than he is. 
and I stand between him and bodily harm. The event of this evening has reconciled me to God and humanity. I have risen in ang angry rebellion against providence. Oh, I have endured very, very bitter misery, Nellie. If that creature knew how bitter, he'd be ashamed to cloud its removal with idle petulance. It was kindness for him which induced me to bear it alone. Had I expressed the agony I frequently felt, he would have been taught to long for its alleviation as ardently as I. However, it's over, and I'll take no revenge on his folly. I can afford to suffer anything hereafter. Should the meanest thing alive slap me on the cheek, I'd not only turn the other, but I'd ask pardon for provoking it. And as proof, I'll go and make my peace with Edgar instantly. Good night. I'm an angel. In this self-complacent conviction she departed, and the success of her fulfilled resolution was obvious on the morrow. Mr Linton had not only abjured his peevishness, though his spirit seemed still subdued by Catherine's exuberance or vivacity, but he ventured no objection to her taking Isabella with her to Wuthering Heights in the afternoon, and she rewarded him with such a summer of sweetness and affection in return as made the house a paradise for several days, both master and servants profiting from the perpetual sunshine. Heathcliff, Mr Heathcliff, I should say in future, used the liberty of visiting at Thrushcross Grange cautiously at first. He seemed estimating how far its owner would bear his intrusion. Catherine also deemed it judicious to moderate her expressions of pleasure in receiving him, and he gradually established his right to be expected. He retained a great deal of the reserve for which his boyhood was remarkable, <coughs> and that served to repress all startling demonstrations of feeling. My master's uneasiness experienced a lull, and further circumstances diverted it into another channel for a space. His new source of trouble sprang from the not anticipated misfortune of Isabella Linton, evincing a sudden and irresistible attraction towards the tolerated guest. She was at that time a charming young lady of eighteen, infantile in manners, though possessed of keen wit, keen feelings and a keen temper too if irritated. Her brother, who loved her tenderly, was appalled at this fantastic preference. Leaving aside the degradation of alliance with a nameless man, and the possible fact that his property in devolt of heirs male might pass into such a one's power, he had sense to comprehend Heathcliff's disposition. To know that, though his exterior was altered, his mind was unchangeable and unchanged, and he dreaded that mind. It revolted him. He shrank forebodingly from the idea of committing Isabella to his keeping. He would have recoiled still more had he been aware that her attachment rose unsolicited and was bestowed where it awakened no reci reciprocation of sentiment. For the minute he discovered its existence, he laid the blame on Heathcliff's deliberate designing. <coughs> we had all remarked during some time that Miss Linton fretted and pined over something. She grew cross and wearisome, snapping and teasing at Catherine continually at the imminent risk of exhausting her limited patience. We excused her to a certain extent on the plea of ill health. She was dwindling and fading before our eyes. But one day, when she had been particularly wayward, rejecting her breakfast, complaining that the servants did not do what she told them, that the mistress would allow her to be nothing in the house and Edgar neglected her, that she caught a cold with the doors being left open and we let the parlour fire go out on purpose to vex her. With a hundred yet more frivolous accusations, Mrs Linton peremptorily insisted that she should get to bed and having scolded her heartily threatened to send for the doctor. Mention of Kenneth caused her to exclaim instantly that her health was perfect and it was only Catherine's harshness which made her unhappy. How can you say I'm harsh, you naughty fondling? cried the mistress, amazed at the unreasonable assertion. You're surely losing your reason. When have I been harsh? Tell me. Yesterday, sobbed Isabella. And now? Yesterday, said her sister-in-law. On what occasion? In our walk along the moor. You told me to ramble where I pleased while you sauntered on with Mr Heathcliff. <clears throat> and that's your notion of harshness, said Catherine, laughing. There was no hint that your company was superfluous. We didn't care whether you kept with us or not. I merely thought Heathcliff's talk would have nothing entertaining for your ears. Oh no, wept the young lady. You wished me away because you knew I liked to be there. Is she sane? asked Mrs Linton, appealing to me. 
I'll repeat our conversation word for word, Isabella, and you point out any charm it could have had for you. I don't mind the conversation, she answered. I wanted to be with... Well, said Catherine, perceiving I hesitate to complete the sentence. With him, and I won't always be sent off, she continued, kindling up. You're a dog in the manger, Cathy, and desire no one to be loved but yourself. <clears throat> you are an impertinent little monkey, exclaimed Mrs Linton in surprise, but I'll not believe this idiocy. It's impossible that you can covet the admiration of Heathcliff, that you consider him an agreeable person. I hope I've misunderstood you, Isabella. No, you have not, said the infatuated girl. I love him more than ever you loved Edgar, and he might love me if you would let him. I wouldn't be you for a kingdom, then, Catherine declared emphatically, and she seemed to speak sincerely. Nelly, help me to convince her that this is madness. Tell her what Heathcliff is, an unreclaimed creature, without refinement, without cultivation, an arid wilderness of firs and windstone, I'd soon as put that little canary into the park on a winter's day, as recommends you to bestow your heart on him. It's deplorable ignorance of his character, child, and nothing else which makes that dream enter your head. Pray, don't imagine that he conceals depths of benevolence and affection beneath the stern exterior. He's not a rough diamond, a pearl containing oyster of a rustic. He's a fierce, pitiless, wolfish man. I never say to him, let this or that em enemy alone, because it would be ungenerous or cruel to harm them. I say, let them alone, because I should hate them to be wronged. And he'd crush you like a sparrow's egg, Isabella, if he found you a troublesome charge. I know he couldn't love a Linton, and yet he'd be quite capable of marrying your fortune and expectations. Avarice is growing within him, a besetting sin. There's my picture, and I'm his friend, so much so that had he thought seriously to catch you, I should perhaps have held my tongue and let you fall into his trap. Mrs Linton regarded her sister-in-law with indignation. For shame, for shame, she repeated angrily. You're worse than twenty foes, you fo poisonous fiend. Ah, you won't believe me then, said Catherine. You think I speak from wicked selfishness. I'm certain you do, retorted Isabella, and I shudder at you. Good, cried the other. Try for yourself, if that be your spirit. I've done, and yield the argument to your saucy insolence. And I must suffer for her egotism, she sobbed as Mrs Linton left the room. All is against me. She's blighted my single consolation. But she uttered falsehoods, didn't she? Mr Heathcliff is not a fiend. He has an honourable soul, and a true one. Or how could he remember her? Banish him from your thoughts, miss, I said. He's a bird of bad omen, no mate for you. Mrs Linton spoke strongly, and yet I cannot contradict her. She's better acquainted with his heart than I, or anyone besides, and she would never represent him as worse than he is. Honest people don't hide their deeds. How has he been living? How has he got rich? Why is he staying at Wuthering Heights, the house of a man whom he abhors? They say Mr Earnshaw is worse and worse since he came. They sit up all night together continually, and Hindley has been borrowing money on his land, and does nothing but play and drink. I heard only a week ago. It was Joseph who told me. I met him at Gimmerton. Nelly, he said, we say a crowner's quest enough at our folks. One of them's almost got his fingers cut off with hand in others for sticking himself like a calf. There's Maester, you know, or soaking up to go to grand sizes. He's no feared at a bench or judges, nor the Paul, nor Peter, nor John, nor Matthew, nor none of them, not he. He fair likes. He langs to set his brazen face again him. And yon bonny lad Heathcliff, yeah, mind, he's a rare un. You can go and laugh as well as anybody's at a rape devil's jest. Does he never say now to his fine living among us when he goes to the Grange? This is way on up at sundown, dice, brandy, cloys, shutters, and candlelight till next day at noon, then to full gangs banging up and raving to his chamber, making decent folk dig their fingers in the lugs for very shame. And the knave, why he can't cr Cant his brass and ate and sleep and off to his neighbours to gossip with wife. Of course he tells Dame Catherine how her father's ghoul runs in his pocket and her father's son gallops down to Broad Road while he flees afore to open to pikes. Now, Miss Linton, Joseph's an old rascal but no liar and if his account of Heathcliff's conduct be true you would never think of desiring such a husband, would you? You are leagued with the rest, Ellen, she replied. 
I'll not listen to your slanders. What malevolence you must have to wish to convince me that there's no happiness in the world. Whether she would have got over this fancy if left to herself or persevered in nursing it perpetually, I cannot say. She had little time to reflect. The day after there was a justice meeting at the next town. My master was obliged to attend and Mr Heathcliff, aware of his absence, called rather earlier than usual. Catherine and Isabella were sitting in the library on hostile terms but silent. The latter alarmed, alarmed at her recent indiscretion and the disclosure she'd made of her secret feelings in a transient fit of passion. The former, on mature consideration, really offended with her companion, and if she laughed again at her pertness, inclined to make it no laughing matter to her. She did laugh as she saw Heathcliff pass the window. I was sweeping the hearth and I noticed a mischievous smile on her lips. Isabella, absorbed in her meditations or a book, remained till the door opened and it was too late to attempt an escape, which she would gladly have done had it been practicable. Come in, that's right, exclaimed the mistress gaily, pulling a chair to the fire. Here are two people sadly in need of a third to thaw the ice between them, and you are the very one we should both choose. Heathcliff, I'm proud to show you at last somebody that dotes on you more than myself. I expect you to feel flattered. Nay, it's not Nelly, don't look at her. My poor little sister-in-law is breaking her heart by mere contemplation of your physical and moral beauty. It lies in your own power to be Edgar's brother. No, no, Isabella, you shan't run off, she continued, arresting with feigned playfulness the confounded girl who'd risen indignantly. We were quarrelling like cats about you, Heathcliff, and I was fairly beaten in protestations of devotion and admiration. And moreover, I was informed that if, if I would have but the manners to stand aside, my rival as she will always have herself to be, would shoot a shaft into your soul that would fix you forever and send my image into eternal oblivion. Catherine, said Isabella, calling up her dignity and disdaining to struggle from the tight grasp that held her, I thank you to adhere to the truth and not slander me, even in joke. Mr Heathcliff, be kind enough to bid this friend of yours release me. She forgets that you and I are not intimate acquaintances and what amuses her is painful to me beyond expression. As the guest answered nothing but took his seat and looked thoroughly indifferent what sentiments she cherished concerning him, she turned and whispered an earnest appeal for liberty to her tormentor. By no means, cried Mrs Linton in answer. I won't be named a dog in the manger again. You shall stay. Now then, Heathcliff, why don't you evince satisfaction at my pleasant news? Isabella swears that the love Edgar has for me is nothing to that she entertains for you. I'm sure she made some speech of the kind, did she not, Ellen? and she has fasted ever since the day before yesterday's walk from sorrow and rage that I dispatched her out of your society under the idea of its being unacceptable. I think you belie her, said Heathcliff, twisting his chair to face them. She wishes to be out of my society now, at any rate. And he stared hard at the object of discourse, as one might do at a strange, repulsive animal, a centipede from the Indies, for instance, which curiosity leads one to examine in spite of the aversion it raises. The poor thing couldn't bear that. She grew white and red in rapid succession, and while tears beaded her lashes, bent the strength of her small fingers to loosen the firm clutch of Catherine's, and perceiving that, as fast as she raised one finger off her arm, another closed down, and she could not remove the hole together, she began to make use of her nails, and their sharpness presently ornamented the detainers with crescents of red. There's a tigress, exclaimed Mrs Linton, setting her free and shaking her hand with pain. Be gone, for God's sake, and hide your vixen face. How foolish to reveal those talons to him. Can't you fancy the conclusions he'll draw? Look, Heathcliff, they are the instruments that will do execution. You must beware of your eyes. I'd wrench them off her fingers if they ever menaced me, he answered brutally, when the door was closed after her. But what did you mean by teasing the creature in that manner, Cathy? You're not speaking the truth, were you? I assure you I was, she returned. She's been dying for your sake several weeks and raving about you this morning and pouring forth a deluge of abuse because I represented your failings in a plain light for the purpose of mitigating her adoration. But don't notice it further. I wish to punish her sauciness, that's all. I like her too well, my dear Heathcliff, to let you absolutely seize and devour her up. And I like her too ill to attempt it, said he except in a very ghoulish fashion. You'd hear of odd things if I lived alone with that mawkish waxen face. The most ordinary would be painting on its white the colours of the rainbow and turning the blue eyes black every day or two. They detestably resemble Linton's. 
delectably observed at Catherine. They are dove size, angels. She's a brother's heir, is she not? He asked after a brief silence. I should be sorry to think so, returned his companion. Half a dozen nephews shall erase her title, please heaven. Abstract your mind from the subject at present. You are too prone to covet your neighbour's goods. Remember, this neighbour's goods are mine. If they were mine, they would be none the less that, said Heathcliff. But though Isabella Linton be silly, she's scarcely mad, and in short, we'll dismiss the matter as you advise. From their tongues they did dismiss it, and Catherine probably from her thoughts. The other, I felt certain, recalled it often in the course of the evening. I saw him smile to himself, grin rather, and lapse into an ominous musing whenever Mrs Linton had occasion to be absent from the apartment. I determined to watch his movements. My heart invariably cleaved to the master's in preference to Catherine's side. With reason, I imagined, for he was kind and trustful and honourable, and she, she could not be called the opposite, yet she seemed to allow herself such wide latitude that I had little faith in her principles and still less sympathy for her feelings. I wanted something to happen which might have the effect of freeing both Wuthering Heights and the Grange of Mr Heathcliff, quietly, leaving us as we had been prior to his advent. His visits were a continual nightmare to me, and I suspected to my master also. His abode at the Heights was an oppression past explaining. I felt that God had forsaken the stray sheep there to its own wicked wanderings, and an evil beast prowled between it and the fold, waiting his time to spring and destroy.'